Hi, I'm Lori Milroy of the Kurdistan 24 Washington, D.C. Bureau, and I'm here this afternoon to speak with Mr. Stephen Mansfield, a very distinguished best-selling author. Welcome, Mr. Mansfield. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Now, you live in Nashville, and there's a huge Kurdish population there. They call it Little Kurdistan. Is that how you became interested in the Kurds? It is. It is. I have to say that my education was not very uh, strong when it came to the Kurds prior to that. But in the 90s, the Kurds began to pour into Nashville. I think that's still the largest Kurdish population in the U.S. And I befriended them, got to know them, helped some organizations that worked with them. And that's not only how I lost my heart to the Kurdish cause, but also ended up in Kurdistan about 20 or 25 times ever since. So that's how it all began. So you followed the Kurds closely since that time? I do. I do. I'm over there maybe every year. Uh, have a number of friends and uh, pay attention to that cause and also talk about it as often as I can. Just made a speech in California about the Kurds. I'm up on the hill a lot here in D.C. and talk, uh, try, not an official lobbyist, but I do my informal lobbying over lunch with as many power brokers as I can. So, Well, we really do appreciate that. How do you see the situation now that the so-called Islamic State has been defeated territorially? How do you see the Kurdish situation after that? Well, I think the Kurds have had distraction after distraction after distraction from building in the KRG, building in the Middle East. Uh, so I'm hoping now, especially with some of the political arrangements that have happened recently, some of the negotiations, uh, that, that real progress can be made. I was there some years ago, and there, were, there was wonderful promise of construction and new deals and funds coming in from overseas and multinational firms coming in, but all that got stalled by the uh, assault of ISIS. So I'm hoping now uh, we can really move forward both in the, in the Middle East but also here in the U.S. Uh, because there's a great deal of education to do, a great gap to sort of close uh, that I think the Kurds can now turn their, their attention to and I want to help with that. Well, that, that's terrific. You know, S Senator uh, Tammy Duckworth spoke recently about Iraq and Kurdistan and she said something very similar to what you said. You know, she's a, a wounded veteran. Yes. And she, f she flew a helicopter. <laughs> She recalled being in the early years of the Iraq War, around 2003, 2004, coming to Kurdistan, and it was undeveloped. She'd land her helicopter on the side of a hill, and then they'd walk up to this one hotel. Right. And she described this amazing cosmopolitan international city now, just like you're describing. Well, it's, it's stunning the progress that's been made despite ISIS, despite political hassles, despite opposition in the region. Uh, so I think things are pretty amazing things are happening. And you know, one of the really wonderful things about the Kurdish cause here in the U.S. is that it's a bipartisan cause. Uh, up on the Hill, some of the strongest advocates for the Kurdish cause are outspoken leading Democrats. And of course, many of the uh, advocates for the Kurdish cause are outspoken, outspoken leading Republicans. Uh, so when I talk to people about the Kurdish cause, politics, uh, U.S. politics don't come into it very much. Uh, so this is a marvelous opportunity to reach across the aisle, build unified coalitions, um, and make some progress. So I, th I think this is, a, this is a really important time right now for the Kurds. Well, and that's a very interesting comment. There aren't many things, particularly these days, that are bipartisan <laughs> causes. <laughs> that's right. But that's right. Kurdistan is certainly one of them. Well, speaking of, you know, U.S. politics and moving it in the right direction, there are many communities, with the Greeks, Jews, Armenians, where the diaspora plays a large role in promoting their mm -hmm. cause. What do you think that the Kurdish, how can the Kurdish diaspora be helpful in these matters? Well, there, there is, as you know, a huge PR gap, so to speak, information gap, knowledge gap between the Kurdish reality and the average, let's just speak of America, uh, the average U.S. citizen. Uh, they don't know very much. I, I've, I've made speeches about the Kurds, and as you know, Kurds are a, a breakfast food here in this country. Um, and so I've often been asked uh, in that, those terms, you know, what do you, why are you talking about a breakfast food? That's how confused people are. Um, so I think every Kurd living in the U.S., in fact, every Kurd in the world, needs to see themselves as part of the PR effort, part of the information effort uh, of the Kurdish people. And uh, I, I think that if they will do that, there, there are many things that can be done. Uh, everything from writing and being involved in local newspapers. And it's, it's wonderful to invite people to Kurdish uh, events and cultural events. That's very important. I've been invited many times. I love it. But at the same time, Kurds have to get into the American system, get into the newspaper, get into the social media. Um, 
I've recommended in some communities that they offer awards to the politician who most represents their cause. You know, just have an annual award, the Kurdish Friendship Award, or whatever you want to call it. In other words, encourage these things. So I tell every Kurd everywhere in the world that I have an opportunity to speak to, represent your people. Represent your people because you're, you're hurt uh, with a huge gap of knowledge that can be closed, uh, but it's not going to be closed by anybody other than the Kurds. Those, those are all very important uh, and interesting ideas and how people will follow through on that. You have a book, The Miracle of the Kurds. Could you explain that book a little bit to us? Sure. I was uh, drawn in, as I say, in Nashville to the Kurdish cause and was very impressed with them and traveled in, in Kurdistan and, th and throughout the world talking to Kurds and learning about the Kurdish cause. And I decided to title my book The, the Miracle of the Kurds. I think it was a miracle that they had survived. I think they had a, a miracle that they had come out in the condition of heart that they were. They, I didn't find them to be bitter. I didn't find them to turn anti-West, even though they'd been betrayed by many Western powers. Um, there they were, moderate Muslims in the be belly of the Middle East. Um, many of them were pro-Israel. Uh, an, an unusual mixture of people, very, as you know, hosp hospitable and gracious and learned. And so I, I found their whole existence to be a miracle, not just that they survived, but who they were as a people. So I wanted to talk about that and commend their story, commend a knowledge of their history to the West. And uh, hopefully I did a little bit of good. You, you, you did a wonderful <laughs> oh, job. Thank you. And I, one of the things I know that U.S. officials, particularly in this administration, appreciate about the Kurds is their religious tolerance in a region that is not tolerant. Is that your experience as well? Absolutely. One of the most fascinating conversations I ever had was with the senior mullah of the Kurdistan region. And he said, I'm not going to let extremism in here. He said, I am a Kurd first and a Muslim second, which was very surprising to me. Um, and he talked about how he wanted to build a, help build a Kurdistan that was open to all religions, but uh, nevertheless had the, uh, a strong religious base, you know, moral and religious base. I was stunned by this because I've, I've traveled extensively in the Middle East. I guest lecture at a Saudi university. And you know the tone is quite different than other parts of the Middle East. So this was the, the moderate tone. This was what, um, not just what Americans want to hear. This was the reality of what he was saying. And I found that to be true. As you know, when, I, when you go or I go to the, uh, uh, the Kurdish regional government, there's a Christian office. There's an Yazidi office. You know, there's a Muslim office. In other words, they're really trying to uh, build a society that's across the board religiously as well as politically and democratically. So I admire that very much. And I know that it is much appreciated in Washington. Yes. And I understand you're about to make another trip to Kurdistan? I'm leaving in a few days. Uh, two things. I'm hoping to help uh, attach an American university over there and get it, get it planned to help with the educational cause. And also, they've graciously asked me, because of some things I've written and some of my academic specialty, to consult on the religious liberty clauses in their constitution. And as you may know, they're trying to roll out a, a new and finished constitution sometime soon, and they've asked me to speak into that. So I'm very honored to play that role. Well, that is a great honor. And we hope to speak to you after you come back from Curtis. I look forward to it. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. We've been talking this afternoon with Stephen Mansfield, a fantastic man, author of the book, The Miracle of the Kurds. It's, it's a must read for, for everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Mansfield. It's great to be with you. Thank you.